I'm going to go through some history, uh, how uh, storage of Spotify looked like in the past years. Then uh, Sandy is going to continue with some details about Cloud Big Table. Then I'm going to uh, go through the migration process that we are doing at Spotify. And then I'm going to add some uh, details about the uh, Big Table Autoscaler that we built uh, during this process. So some history. Um, so when I joined Spotify, it was three, year, three years ago, three years and a half ago. And uh, we just started moving to GCP, uh, I remember. And I've been exposed marginally to what was there before. Uh, there was basically on-prem data centers. We had four of them, two in the US and two in Europe. And so we used to manage our machines. And uh, being in the uh, storage infrastructure team uh, at the time, and, and still am, uh, we had basically two databases, so it looked like this. Like we had Cassandra and Postgres. So that means that we also manage our uh, databases, not just the machines. Um, so in this talk, I'm going to focus uh, quite a lot on Cassandra, uh, because it became extremely popular at Spotify. And I'm going to start telling you why it became so popular. In, uh, in a word, uh, Cassandra is versatile. So it can do uh, many things quite well. Uh, it has tunable consistency. Uh, it has tunable performance. It has a lot of knobs that you can tune to almost optimize at the use case level, uh, I would say. It has global application. Uh, it scales pretty well from very small, like order of megabytes to uh, terabytes uh, in terms of data set size. And it comes with a handy uh, query language similar to SQL and light for transactions. So you can express things like uh, insert if not exist, uh, which is a pretty powerful feature. Um, this feature made uh, Cassandra the database of Spotify, as I said. And um, here are some numbers that I digged. Uh, it took me quite a while to find them, because from like uh, when Cassandra was a peak, that was approximately one, one, year, one year and a half ago. Um, yeah. So yeah, a lot of uh, machines, a lot of clusters, and um, in that. Um, but Cassandra, uh, yeah, even if it was widely used, uh, is not perfect. It comes with a set of problems. I would say the biggest is the fact that storage is co is coupled to compute, uh, and this makes uh, topology changes very expensive, because uh, think like. For example, you are running out of disk, and you are forced to scale out your, uh, your cluster, even if maybe you don't need more compute, for example. And uh, topology changes needs to shuffle data around, so it takes a lot of, lot of time, like especially if you have a lot of data. Uh, as I said, it's very tunable, uh, which is good, but it's also bad sometimes because uh, it's too much. It has a very uh, long learning curve, uh, and means like, Teams need to be er experts at operating Cassandra. And in our case, we manage some of these uh, clusters, the most critical ones. But in general, we, have the, uh, we believe in, uh, in the so-called uh, ops in squad. So the, 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 the teams uh, manage their, their own uh, clusters. Uh, so yeah, it comes with a pretty high operational burden in that sense. Uh, it scales uh, until it doesn't, uh, pretty much. Uh, we had some cases where we like uh, we we really felt like we we couldn't add any more nodes to a specific cluster because it would have blow up. And um, the Cassandra version we use, uh, which is not data stacks, doesn't come with uh, data exports and backups. So also that was uh, tricky. Uh, in my team, we used to uh, build tools basically to. Um, uh, alleviate these pains. So we provide uh, automation to other teams in the company. And all sorts of things that I already mentioned, like, uh, for example, we have tools for uh, just configuration and, uh, like, I don't know, updating and topology changes. Uh, one of them is CSTAR that we open source. That is basically a par parallel SSH, topology aware, so it knows for example, if you want to restart Cassandra, it knows in which order you should do it to not uh, to avoid having unavailable data, uh, unavailable ranges of data. Uh, we have Cassandra Reaper, that maybe is the most famous tool we wrote. It's about um, anti-entropy repairs. 
Uh, we wrote tools for data exports like Hazel and yeah, Hacubi is for topology changes, like all sorts of things. And we eventually got to a pretty good spot, like uh, say pretty much uh, give me a Cassandra cluster with this number of nodes, with this machine type, uh, with backups and exports on a schedule, and yeah, so pretty much quite easy, but there's a lot of work in man maintaining all these tools, and uh, some operations are still extremely expensive. Like, imagine you want to update the operating system on three, 4,000 hosts. Yeah, it takes a long time. Um, in this setting, uh, we started looking at cloud providers, um, and we eventually chose GCP. Um, it, it not only because of storage, but I mean, the, the move to GCP was framing a much bigger scope, of course. But, and the idea was to uh, basically move up the stack, in a sense. So free uh, as much as possible of our time to, and do things more closely related to our business logic instead of doing uh, infrastructure and managing machines. Uh, it should be cheaper also. And uh, yeah, that was basically the idea. And um, uh, we should also, it should also be possible to uh, so having more time and uh, working at a different abstraction level to add value on top of these technologies. And we have many success stories of this, like CEO uh, for scheduling um, uh, jobs in all sorts of jobs, I guess. Uh, no, sorry, sticks is for scheduling. And CEO is for data flow jobs, for Zeti, security, and, uh, and the autoscaler that I'm going to talk about later. Uh, I would say we mostly succeeded in achieving these things, uh, and now we're fully on GCP. Uh, but even if you're fully on GCP, the situation uh, looked like this for a, for a while more. Uh, so basically, we just migrated the, um, the physical machines to VMs, and it worked, worked fairly well, but at some point we asked ourselves, like, can we use something that Google is providing, like managed storage, like Bigtable, Cloud Bigtable? And I will give a, uh, Sandy's gonna continue talking about that. <laughs> Thanks, Emilio. Yeah, I just want to provide a brief overview of Cloud Bigtable and where we think it delivers customers value like Spotify. So really quickly, what is Cloud Bigtable? Cloud Bigtable is a petabyte scale, fully managed NoSQL database. The original Bigtable technology was built to index the web, and in its history has served billion user applications within Google, like Gmail and Search. The cloud product is meant to serve use cases where low latency data access, scalability, and reliability are critical. As a fully managed service, it scales seamlessly, and we're also well integrated with the Apache ecosystem, offering an HBase API. And Bigtable sits within a broader uh, portfolio of database and storage products, all of which remove the burden of building and managing storage and infrastructure. Uh, specifically, it sits in the non-relational space as a wide column store, again, offering super high performance in terms of latency and throughput. So what can Cloud Bigtable offer you? Where does the value come from? I tend to focus on four areas speed, scalability, full management, and integrations. I'll talk about speed and scalability more in a second, because I think that's what's differentiating about Bigtable. Um, and integration is with a broader ecosystem is what allows it to plug easily into your existing architecture. But I want to pause for a second on full management, because this is something we're thinking about very holistically. What, is it, what can we do to lessen the operational cost of managing a database? And so some of that, yes, is managing the infrastructure and database layer, uh, having RSREs paged so that you're not paged. Um, it also means delivering the availability, data durability, and security that you've come to expect from Google. Um, but for me, it also means providing value-add tools to make the database easier to work with in every way. So one quick example of that is Key Visualizer, which we launched last year at Next, which is basically a heat map of your key space and shows data access patterns. So again, not only are we managing that infrastructure and keeping you from getting paged, um, but we're also giving you visibility into your data and making the parts of the process that you own, like schema design, a lot easier. So again, as a managed service, we're thinking a lot about how to reduce that operational burden. 
And as promised, jumping into speed again, this is where I think Bigtable is unique. On the throughput side, we're offering 10 megabytes per second in write throughput and 220 megabytes per second in read scan throughput. I want to emphasize here that um, generally in Bigtable, reads and writes are the same price. So customers with write-heavy workloads in particular will see excised performance um, because of that high write throughput. Um, and we also offer low latency random data access in the single digit milliseconds. Scalability. So I think there are two things to focus on here. Um, again, Bigtable was built for scale and has the ability to handle internet sized applications. That's because performance, which we measure in QPS queries per second, uh, scales linearly as you increase the number of nodes. I think our published guidelines say that you should expect 10,000 QPS per node. Um, and that's true whether you have three nodes or 300. Um, and second, you can scale up and scale down with Bigtable super easily. Again, this is what makes Bigtable price effective for spiky workloads, because you can scale up to handle the spike and back down when things cool down. Um, and Amelia is going to speak a little bit about um, how they leverage this characteristic in building their autoscaler to get cost savings. Uh, to dive a little bit deeper on how Bigtable is able to deliver that price or that performance and scale, uh, I want to touch a little bit on how Bigtable works. So Bigtable separates the processing layer from the storage layer, which allows us to optimize throughput by adjusting the association of storage and nodes. So in this example, we start with uh, three nodes and four splits of the data that are stored separately in our storage layer. And in the rebalancing example, we might be seeing heavy traffic to data group A. And so node one is experiencing large load in this case. Bigtable is going to automatically rebalance and move some of that traffic to another load, ensuring broader, better overall performance. Um, and again, resizing comes into play when another node is added to the mix. And again, we're able to rebalance without any downtime, because instead of moving data around, we're just reassigning the node to a different uh, data group. I also wanted to touch base on one uh, feature that's been recently made available, um, and that Spotify has leveraged uh, pretty intensely, which is uh, Cloud Bigtable uh, Replication. Replication is, allows you to increase your availability with a 99.99% SLA um, by allowing you to fail over in the case of a geo disaster. It also allows you to isolate batch and serving workloads. And finally, if you're replicating globally, like Spotify does, you can serve a global user base by, making, by offering customers low latency data access to local replicas. And there are a few things that I think are special here. Uh, you write data once, and you can write data to any one of those replicas, and it's automatically replicated everywhere with zero consistency. And finally, there are no ma manual steps. Um, so you're not writing tools to repair data or synchronize writes and deletes. Uh, replication just works and uh, will eventually be consistent. Um, we have a, if you're interested in learning more about replication, um, I hope you'll join Carter Page, our engineering manager, in talking about it tomorrow. Uh, that is DBS 307 at 2.10 PM, um, building a global data presence. That's my quick plug. Um, but yeah, uh, handing it back over to Emilio to talk about how they approach the migration. Thank you. So yeah, our migration, well, yeah, first, let's uh, just a short recap about uh, what Sandy said. Like, the Cloud Big Table is managed, uh, is eventually consistent, uh, like Cassandra, but no lightweight transactions. Uh, storage is the couple from compute and is designed for big data sets. So, the first thing you might ask yourself is, are, is Cassandra the same thing as Bigtable? And yeah, the answer is most of the time, you can map uh, data sets that you had on Cassandra to Bigtable. Uh, we found at Spotify that the most common uh, scenarios that we can map very well are uh, eventually consistent or low consistency um, needs. Uh, when we have 
ephemeral semi-persistent data. Uh, maybe you have regionally partitioned data. And by this, I mean uh, that a certain set of the data is accessed only from a certain region. Like, for example, European data is only accessed in Europe, and so on. Uh, because they have some cool features that are available in that way, um, the uh, single row transactions, basically. And of course, large data sets. This use case map uh, very well. Other use cases, they don't map well. Um, we found some. Uh, we found that we had, uh, as you can imagine, some um, cases where we use this uh, insert if not exist, and this is not available in Big Table. So it's simply, uh, it's simply, you simply have to find something else. Um, and also, we have uh, quite a lot, and this was kind of unexpected at the, be at the beginning, uh, of these so-called small key value stores, uh, we call. So we, we have not much data, maybe order of from megabytes to a few gigabytes. But still, you need to have uh, global replication, so to, to have low latency globally. And they have very, very low or sometimes very high QPS. This also doesn't map uh, well. So uh, summarizing, this is, the, this is the truth that we found during our migration. So there is a pretty big overlap between Cassandra and Bigtable uh, for this low consistency and uh, high throughput scenarios. And we have these two uh, uh, use cases where that they call small key value stores and more consistent. And I am fairly sure that there is nothing in the blue part of this graph. Uh, so it's all one of these three cases, basically, at least at Spotify. Uh, it took a while to find out this. Um, I suggest if you're doing a migration like this, try to figure out these things beforehand. Uh, just don't say, oh, yeah, go and use Bigtable, and, because people are going to come back to you and say, oh, yeah, but we don't have these features, and that uh, doesn't work. Um, and for us, it was also kind of funny, because at the beginning, we had two features that were very important for us that were missing. Backups, uh, for which we built an internal stopgap solution, and global application that now is available. But at the time, we built a, a, a replicator, a custom replicator based on Cloud PubSub. And I wrote it like, it uh, was a potentially consistent replicator, because at some point we found that uh, basically it could, you could lose some data, especially, if I remember correctly, it was something about ordering of inserts and deletes. Uh, yeah, so it was pretty funny that after two weeks, oh, well, yeah, well, oh, well, we could lose data. Oh, yeah. Anyway, this, uh, these two features are now are available, and uh, yeah, we use them a lot. Um, uh, at least, sorry, the global location backups. Uh, yeah. Maybe you're going to get a question. About <laughs> 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 and so now immigration is going um, slowly. Uh, we are, I would say, half away. But yeah, we see that the number of uh, big table nodes is increasing, and the number of uh, Cassandra nodes is uh, decreasing. Um, as a success story of migration, uh, I would like to talk about the playback cluster um, that basically implements, um, is very crucial for implementing the connect feature, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and it stores basically the device state. Uh, so you have multiple devices, like TVs, speakers, and you store the state of these devices. Um, the state can be pretty big, depending on how the, um, yeah, how the device works. And uh, it's very, um, it's, uh, sorry, it's low consistency data. Is, uh, I mean, if you lose the state or you just gen generate a new one, it's not a super big deal. And you need a very, very high performance. Because imagine like you skip a song, you go, like, that's a change of the state. So, and if you count how many users, how many devices we, there are, it's like uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, requests. In particular, we, had, we used to have on Cassandra 150,000 QPS a peak in three data centers. We used to have 450 machines with 7,000 cores, uh, more or less and 2.5 petabytes of SSD just for this cluster. And this was one of the examples where I was saying, like, this cluster was really pushed to the limit. Like, we couldn't add another, I don't know, 100 nodes to this cluster. Uh, the, the, the team managing this cluster, we used to have, I believe, one incident a day uh, at, during the last weeks of life. <laughs> and 
as a fun fact, or I would say what, what was tragically bad about this cluster is that we were using just very little of the disk, of, of the disk for the actual unique data, because we had to over-provision a lot in terms of disk space to, um, to handle Cassandra compactions. Like, you don't want to run out of disk space in a Cassandra cluster, and we had to work provision a lot to, to prevent that, basically. And the data is very ephemeral, uh, so yeah, a lot of compactions. Uh, on Big Table, it worked out very well. Uh, we recently migrated, like three, four months ago. Uh, the team is very happy. They didn't have any operational headaches so far. We auto scale this cluster in between 150 to 250 nodes, so we also have less nodes. And we pay for the data that we use. So we have approximately 40 terabytes of unique data, and yeah, we just pay for that. Uh, it was also nice because we, we work pretty closely with Google engineers. Uh, they were developing a new um, client, Java client. And yeah, working with the emulator is also cool. So yeah, it was a very nice experience. Uh, and this is like um, yeah, a chart of the, the cost drop. Uh, the day we shut down the Cassandra machines. Mm, you can see uh, the, in green the compute, compute engine cost. Uh, it, it doesn't go down to zero because we also have the service nodes in the, in the project. Uh, but nevertheless, it's like approximately a 75% uh, drop in cost, which is pretty big. Just a few words on how we did this uh, migration. Uh, it's an online migration, so we didn't uh, say, okay, now, now the feature is disabled for like a few hours and we swap, but it was always online. Um, what we did is we implemented a storage interface based on Bigtable, and we run that together with Cassandra. Uh, and of course, Cassandra was the primary database for um, half of this process. And we slowly uh, send traffic to Bigtable uh, in order to detect bugs, to detect um, uh, problems, or understand performance. In general, to gain confidence that everything works. And by doing that, you can also compare like, the data that you read from Cassandra and the data that you read from Bigtable and see that everything makes sense. And so, yeah, as I was saying, it, it, the more confidence you, you get, the more traffic you, in, you can send to Bigtable, and eventually you have 100% read and write, and uh, when, you, when you feel good, you do the swap in between Cassandra and Bigtable, and eventually you drop Cassandra. So it's pretty simple. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple because this kind of data is eph ephemeral, so eventually, basically, your, your, your two databases converge to the same data, and, and if you have few errors, it's fine uh, in this case, or in cases like this. And in cases where you have persistent data, so you cannot uh, tolerate errors, like let's say our playlist cluster, uh, it's much more tricky, at least with the Cassandra version uh, that we have. Um, in general, it's tricky because, I mean, keeping in sync to distributed databases is not uh, the best. Um, but you, um, uh, there is a pretty difficult problem to solve around uh, deletes, that even if you um, sync often the, the data from the two databases, like the, the deletes are not in the data export, uh, unless you do logical deletes. Uh, if you don't do logical deletes, you need to change the schema, which is also very painful. Um, uh, Google has a, has a solution for this, which is based on newer versions of a Cassandra, which, which we don't use. Um, and yeah, we are working around this. Another thing we're working on is uh, trying to abstract, uh, let's say, the database layer. Uh, so having um, uh, like an interface that ab abstracts away which database we're using. Uh, like you may interact with Cloud Spanner or Cloud Big Table or Cassandra more or less in the same way. Uh, and this is something more for the future, so maybe if we have to do this again, it's going to be much less painful. But we could also implement pretty cool things, like uh, doing this uh, dual storage uh, transparently for the user. And it's a pretty cool project, and yeah, hopefully we're going to open source it if it works. <laughs> uh, said that, uh, during this process, we also developed an autoscaler, uh, which it wouldn't be impossible with Cassandra at all, because as I said, um, 
changing the number of nodes in a Cassandra cluster takes time, especially with big cluster take days. And so with Bitable, it's very, very nice to scale up and down in within minutes. It started as a hack project, and it was taken from bits and pieces of other uh, autoscalers. I think we had five autoscalers at some point. So we, we had to build one to uh, rule them all, and so we call it the amazing Big Table Autoscaler. And it's a very simple setup. It's a Java microservice with, a, with some state uh, kept in a Cloud SQL database. Uh, it basically, the logic is more or less fetch the cluster data, the, the cluster status every 30 seconds, I believe, uh, and take an action or not. Um, and it's open source. Before going uh, more into the details of the logic, which is very simple, uh, I just want to show what is the effect of using the autoscaler. Uh, normally, so when you have a constant amount of resources, in this case, uh, a constant amount of nodes, you would say that the, you have day and night, um, yeah, day and night cycles in CPU uh, in Cassandra, for example. That was that was the case um, because you have more users during the day, less using during, during the night. Uh, using our scaler, you, we see the opposite. So we can keep the CPU utilization pretty much constant and uh, changing the resources over time. Um, and it, yeah, this uh, shows that. This graph shows that it works pretty well. Um, and it works also for replicated clusters, uh, because um, we do the scaling uh, at the cluster level, not at the instance level. So we can yeah, scale in independently different regions, basically. And the logic, as I was saying, is very simple. Um, so basically, the user defines a target load and the autoscaler, uh, so, so given, the, given you have number of nodes n, it just tries to calculate n1 such that the load is what the user defined. It's just an arith arithmetic proportion, basically. Um, and then we have some, uh, some checks. Some, uh, we want to respe respect some properties. Uh, so it's a very simple state machine. Uh, for example, we want to respect the storage per node quota. Uh, otherwise, the cluster stops receiving writes. Uh, we want to have n1, so the new number of nodes should be in within the boundaries that the user sets. And also, we don't want to scale too frequently uh, because one, one is because we have uh, a certain amount of admin uh, operations, so there is a quota on admin operations. And, but also, we have some latency spikes uh, associated to upscales or downscales, which is also something we are working to, with Google to solve. Um, yeah, but as you see, it's like very simple logic. And for us, it worked really well. The only real problem we, we found is related to data jobs, uh, data flow jobs in our case, because they, um, they are like sudden spikes of load on the cluster. And the autoscaler cannot scale fast enough. Um, so basically, and I think the, the general recommendation from Google is like if you are doing a very heavy data flow job, you should upscale like 20 minutes before. And that's a solution. Uh, another solution could be to throttling, throttling the data flow jobs. Um, and this is, sounds pretty crazy, but it's fairly doable if you use a framework. In, in our case, we use a framework, SEO. Uh, so we could implement in SEO, say, uh, yeah, start slow and slowly increase the, the rate in a way that the autoscaler can cope with it, with that. Another uh, solution could be to use uh, like a predictive, uh, so tr transform it in a predictive process or integrate some predictions, uh, like Facebook Profit. And this would work if you have data flow jobs on a certain schedule, uh, not if you have random during the day. Right now, we went with the second one because it was the recommendation and it's like more or less what we were already doing. So. Yeah, and it works so far. <laughs> so yeah, um, wrapping up, uh, manage is great. We we love it. <laughs> Our teams are very happy when uh, moving away from Cassandra. We think for us it's the way forward because we want to yeah free as much as our time as possible. 
is not the migration is not an easy process. Uh, you still need to understand what's like uh, you, you can't completely forget how things work, of course. And um, I would say if there is one key takeaway for us uh, in our storage infrastructure team is that you need to make the process as easy as possible for the user. So um, like documentation, like evangel evangelizing good um, migrations, uh, like the, the, the most you can do, or tooling also, the most you can do for them, the better it is. And yeah, autoscaling is a great example of value that we can evangelize. Uh, added on top of this, and uh, yeah, the time and mostly the time. No, the, I, I'm, not, I'm not even sure how much uh, money we're saving, but the time is the time savings are a big win. <laughs>